With a quorum being present, uh, call this meeting of the Recreation and Parks Advisory Committee to order. Uh, everybody has a copy of the agenda. And with that, motion to approve the agenda is present. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. And everybody has been uh, handed a copy of the minutes from last meeting. Everybody a chance to take a look at those? Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the minutes as presented. Okay. So a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And with that, motion carries. That takes us up to the director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And oh, sorry, the new members. Oh, we have that farther down, but we can jump around. Absolutely. We have a couple of uh, new faces tonight. One is a, a full voting member, Mr. Jeff Kane. Uh, Jeff and his, his family own a couple of the bike shops here in town. And uh, we uh, are excited to have uh, Jeff's addition to the, to the committee. Welcome. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Now, the non-voting member, some of you may recognize. He's rather infamous around town. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Jim Wheeler is joining us as uh, it's a leadership development mm -hmm. position, um, basically uh, welcoming, in, welcome, welcoming him to the discussion, to the conversation, but he is not able to vote um, as, part of, uh, as part of this committee. Uh, hopefully we will uh, listen to his, uh, his ideas and opinions just the way we would to a voting members. But Jim, welcome. We have a couple of, I guess these are pins in here? Yes. Uh, for Jeff and for Jim. <laughs> but welcome to both of you and uh, look forward to, to working with you. Okay, director's report. Last meeting you guys will recall that uh, staff had been asked to do some preliminary research on uh, possibility and viability of bringing a water park to the city. And I think we have a brief, yeah, here we go. Uh, just some preliminary information for you. Um, just And as a reminder, the value to the city would be several things. One would be, of course, having a service available to, to the families. Um, the other part of that is a service available to the young Marines. Uh, another benefit to the city or value to the city would be the tax base. Um, these are very lucrative, generally speaking, very lucrative enterprises. And so the sales tax, even though we're not getting as much of it as we once were, we do still get some benefit from some of the sales tax. Um, so those are some of the reasons that we might be interested in bringing one or seeing one come to the city. So, Amanda, you want to talk about this since you did the research? Let me give you the, the I'll, floor. I'll do a few slides. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we um, sent the survey to a total of eight area water parks, and then some of those were also located in the Northern Virginia area where the <coughs> park authority in that area operates five water parks. We received um, four responses, one being from a municipal or public water park, uh, two private water parks, and then one which was a public-private partnership. Um, out of those, we've put together some data for you and also used some data from a national study that was done in 2012 by uh, an international organization for area water parks. And um, one question they asked is, how large is your property? And as you can see, the, lo the majority of the properties are over 21 acres. And then also the one to five acre size tends to, to have a high percentage um, of parks as well, to as give you an idea how much space would be needed. And as you can see from Amanda's notes on the side of the, of the chart, um, when you're talking about that much acreage or those that much square feet that's not just the water amenities that's the parking that's the operational requirements as well total area required yes, yes. Um, one of the questions we asked the, in our local survey uh, were the top five most popular attractions or experiences that they have within their facility number one um, <coughs> was the tipping bucket area i've put an illustration there in case you're not familiar with it um, tends to be very popular amongst the younger kids. Um, my 11-year-old loves them, <laughs> uh, just the anticipation of them. The second one was a speed slide, which is the faster speed and higher, um, larger height slides. And then you see the others there, the Lazy River, a toddler and children's play area, and another mat slide. 
and I'm not sure what the difference is between the speed slide and the foam slide sidewinder, but uh, there you have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I like it, Dave. Yeah. The speed slide, you sit on it and down you go. And the other one, you have to sit on on a mat. On a mat. Yeah. Oh. And it has more twists and turns. Okay. This one here, in the middle of that um, illustration there, speed. that's the speed slide, and the ones to each side would be more of your mat slide. Mm -hmm. Yes. We also asked them the primary target demographic for the facilities, and number one was families with children's a children ages two through twelve. And the secondary target demographic tended to be teenagers aged 11 to 17. So that'll give you an idea of you know why they choose the, the experiences or equipment that they have. Um, in the national study, the question was asked, what percentage of your guests visit from these distances away from your facility? Any ideas on how no, you got, far? No, we gotta make these guys show. Yes. How many of you think um, majority of the participants come from zero to five miles or six to ten miles there's one six two six to ten uh, eleven to twenty five mm -hmm. one twenty six to fifty mm -hmm. there's a few there's okay and more than fifty Lynn mm -hmm. thinks more than fifty okay yeah I don't remember <coughs> there, is um, there you go average distance is fifty five miles mm -hmm. Yes. So <coughs> back to the, the potential values of having a, this sort of amenity within the city, that's people from outside the city that would be coming in and spending money here, if, no, if for no other reason. Mm -hmm. So that was basically the, the first wave of the research that we got on the water parks. Um, any questions, comments? We just wanted to make sure that we shared that with you since we mentioned it to you last month. From here, with that, it's, uh, we'll probably give council the same information and see if they have any more direction for us from there. From the four responses that you got, I I'm assuming all those four were all successful in one way or another. The uh, public-private partnership one has been, o this is their first summer open. That would be um, from Lions Park in Kinston. Um, the two private ones I received input from was one located in White Lake and uh, the other was um, Jungle Rapids in Wilmington. And then the, um, the municipal public one was the Newburn Aquatic Center. They have a water park there where they have their swimming pools and things. What, sorry, what's the public part of the park the public part of the partnership was the city of Kinston. What did they give? What did they, they provided, um, one thing that I do recall is they provide the liability insurance every year for the facility. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the details of other things the that they may have provided, mm -hmm. yes. Um, Woodman of the World, um, the Lions, Area Lions Club in mm -hmm. Lenore County also provided funding. So it was a, a joint effort by a number of organizations. Mm -hmm. Tim, I mentioned to you when I was back in Kansas City this spring that the uh, YMCA and the local government there got a partnership like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the split is, but the YMCA basically manages the facility. Uh, but the city of Kansas City provides uh, either tax break or perhaps uh, insurance relief. Mm -hmm. How about safety? Would you have somebody there to supervise? All the recreation advisory board members in those communities volunteer their time. <laughs> <laughs> Need some excitement? I did find that there is an industry standard, and that's what most of them follow. And they do have their you know safety programs in place. About charge admission, or is haven't gone that far? I asked that question as well. Um, most of them are a set fee. Mm -hmm. Um, the ones that tend to be lower in cost were your public owned and operated as well as your partnership, public-private partnerships. You mentioned the one that's at White Lake. Uh, I've actually visited that one uh, and talked to the person who owns it and he has actually come to Jacksonville and visited. Uh, he is a person who believes that this community is ripe for this facility that it could be very successful as a private venture or as a public venture or as a joint venture. It is interesting to talk to him and he said that the 
the number one thing right now that is keeping a private venture from coming here is financing. That while you can get, if you're in Myrtle Beach and you own a hotel, you can get money by leveraging the hotel to build a three or four or five million dollar water park as a component of it. But if you're a private vendor and you're trying to get money just to build a park, there are very few banks that are lining up for that at this time. But I will say to you, he is one of those that believes very strongly that Jacksonville would be a success. Uh, he also gave me some interesting uh, insight as to, on his park, who uses the park components. Mm -hmm. And I'll take just a second to share that with you. Uh, he said that the teenage group loves the swimming pool. And it's not because they swim. It's because they like to court around the swimming pool. That the uh, young teenage boys and the younger children, ages 6 through 12, really love the slides and the exciting components of it. That the mothers who come with young children like the splash pads or, or bucket drops, and that nearly every component loves the lazy river component. So he said there's something there for grandparents, through grandchildren, through teenagers, you know, almost any component. Uh, but that was his, and, and they are open from uh, the week before Memorial Day until the week after Labor Day, I believe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Another factor uh, for the military that live out in town, you'd say, well, why, why would I pay to go to a public pool here when I can go on base and swim for free? Mm -hmm. Well, currently that's no longer the case because of sequestration. They're actually charging to go on base. So that subject to change, uh, you might have military people who would just as soon go to a facility here in town as opposed to wasting their gas to go on base and pay there too. And plus the fact what they have on base is not what we would be talking about here. It would be a different type of recreational opportunity. And just to, to add my three cents worth, since we already got one and two, um, in Northern Virginia, as Amanda mentioned, there is a regional park authority that manages five of these, mm -hmm. and they are revenue rich. Um, I mean, up in that part of the country, they aren't open year round. Again, it's the summer season. Uh, so you're paying staff, you're paying liability, you're paying the, the whatever maintenance. Um, but uh, so there are models out there that show it can work in. in many different configurations. Anything else on the water parks? I know you guys had some concerns and, and comments last month. Is there anything to add to the discussion at, at this point? Uh, <coughs> Dr. Woodruff mentioned they said swimming pool. That's like the big buzzword for us, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. So would, I mean, are we talking Olympic size swimming pool where kids can get swimming lessons out of this? Well, the answer there is it's too early to tell. I can tell you that what they put in most of the water parks is not that. What they basically put in is something that is uh, maybe twice the size of a family size pool. Because what they're interested in is deck space, chairs to sit around, get I've a nice seen, suntan. Yeah. I've seen those, yeah. Uh, that's what normally goes into a water park. On the other side of it, what I would say is this. You know, we're in the infant stage. And that's part of what the research will do and part of what your guidance would be is, okay, in addition to apparently everybody likes a bucket drop and a speed slide, and apparently including the chairman likes the speed slide. <laughs> Was that a personal testimony a moment ago? Oh, yeah. You ever been to uh, Water Country USA up there? Yeah, oh, really? <coughs> I hate but, it when uh, my kids got too old. <laughs> but likewise, if, if you feel that part of this should be something like a lap pool or part of it should be an Olympic-sized pool or, 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 you know, it's part we, of the dialogue. We were a little bit, last, <clears throat> last meeting, we were a little bit uh, concerned about the direction of the city council <clears throat> on a pool. Was it a priority or what was city council, what were they leaning towards or what would they like? And uh, finances, insurance, and all came up. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Or can you give us one? I mean, well, I can, uh, I can certainly give you an opinion. Uh, the council is in the research stage just like you are. Uh, they're not really 
uh, sure how it could be financed. They're not sure exactly what components it would be. They're open to the dialogue. And I think that's the important thing for the staff and for you as an advisory group and the city council to do is to figure out a process or to walk the process together and to look at the pros and cons together. What we do know is that more and more municipalities are having to close indoor swimming pools. That if you're going to have a quote unquote swimming pool, it needs to be seasonal only because a indoor facility, you have to heat and staff 365 days a year. And more and more communities are finding they cannot afford that. On the other hand, what we are finding is that a facility that has a good cross-section of activities, not just swimming, but a good cross-section of activities seems to be something that can be a revenue producer because as you can, if I may use this as an analogy, if you take your children there and it is just swimming, they may be excited for the first week of summer. But going and getting sun and getting a little swim, you know, you have to keep the excitement and that's why having a multiple of activities at a facility, everything from a basic swimming to, you know, uh, I mean, I've been to one in Cape Coral, Florida that even has a zip line that you come down and drop into the water. And I'm telling you on Saturdays and Sundays, they are 50 deep waiting for that experience. But together, you know, the, the council has certainly not said we're going to do this. Well, council has said, they want a good study. They want your thoughts. We will determine <coughs> what would fit here and how we could possibly fund it. And that was the short answer to that, so I apologize. Well, that's a big help. We appreciate it. We appreciate you here to explain that to us. Amanda, did you, did Kinston, that's the newest, did they share how much it cost to get up and running? Uh, they did not. Yeah, they did share their what they're estimating their revenues to be at. Lynn, what I would tell you is from the discussion with the gentleman at White Lake, mm -hmm. uh, you're talking three to four million dollars. I mean, you're not talking an inexpensive uh, venture sure. here. And to make and what he said to me was this: it is better not to do it than to do it on a shoestring. Sure. It is better to come out of the gates with something that's dynamic and something that really can generate interest. Do it, do it right. That's yes. right. You don't do it halfway. That's right. Anybody else? Gets us to Wooten Park, I guess. Yes, it does. Okay. Update on Wooten Park. Um, the restrooms, they had all the rain we've had recently sort of slowed down the, the ongoing projects there, but the restroom they're still saying should be done by the end of September, so for argument's sake, let's say October 1. Um, the new playground equipment is in. They are laying in layers, the rubberized surface, and when I went by there this morning, they had all but like two of the designs laid down so allowing that to age for 24 hours once they're done let's say Friday at the latest that should be ready to go now there is one last piece for the Wooten Park renovation you guys remember we did the basketball courts um, we're also going now we have this new piece of equipment we're taking out the old equipment and we're going to either reinstall it or um, with the monies left in the project we can buy another new piece of equipment for the younger age We'll put that over um, by the, the new dome. So that uh, that will then be finished by December. Mm. So Wooten is, is making progress. And, and hopefully the monthly inspector uh, noticed that. Took the thunder away from me. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. <laughs> sorry. Never want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll give it so, um, as, as I hope you don't mind if I do. When we looked at the restrooms, we decided that it was time to bring a new design to the facilities of the city. Uh, we're certainly not critical of what we put in at the commons, but they, they are not, um, well, I mean, they, they just are concrete. And we want something that is much more uh, user-friendly and sets a theme for the parks. And so you've seen the new design. That is the design that we hope we can use as we need to have new restrooms, 
or, rep or the replacement of current restrooms throughout our facility. And also, while we're talking about Wooten, you know, the mayor and council have said that they want us to take the existing parks and completely rework them. They do not want us to take a park and just put a Band-Aid on it and then three years later having to put a Band-Aid on it again. So that's why when we leave Wooten Park this time, it will be, for all practical purposes, mm -hmm. finished for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're really trying to focus our revenues, just like we're, we're doing, as you'll hear a minute, on Jack M. Yet and Phillips Park and those parks. <coughs> Okay, the next one was an update on Phillips and, and the part of Grant. Um, actually, next, next Tuesday, September 3rd, at the council workshop, so the 5 o'clock meeting that they hold in this room, we will be given, um, uh, maybe not the entire time, but put the bulk of their workshop to talk about the master plan and how the master plan has guided the work we've been doing and ultimately to get them to, un to see how the work at Phillips Park that's proposed is tied into the master plan and get them to um, agree or disagree with going ahead and starting that project. Um, it is, we have identified within finance that we do have, the city does have the funding available. Um, it becomes a, a council decision whether or not they want to go ahead and, and uh, you know, authorize that actual expenditure. From the state side, those that are funding the Part F piece of it, we really need to let them know by October 1. If we're not going to do this, we need to basically give their money back. Um, but uh, we, we need to decide that by the, by the end of September, by October 1 again. Uh, but September 3rd is when we will be meeting with council in here, uh, giving them an update on all of the projects, all of the master plan. But one of the specific questions we'll be asking them at the end is, is are we good to go now with uh, Phillips Park and the part of Grant? We would certainly invite you all to attend. Uh, there's, it wouldn't be a joint session, <coughs> but as the advisors to the council, uh, of course, you can stay at home and, and uh, enjoy supper and watch it on G10, or we'd certainly welcome you to be in this room at 5 o'clock on Tuesday of this coming week. Tim, just yes. for the new members, hmm? how much product did we receive and how much matching fund did we have? Basically, it's a million-dollar project. And then I think the, the grant is 499000 $490,000 from Pardiff with a $500,000 match from the city. So, it's, so if the city invests a half a million, they'll get a million worth of project. Did that include the amphitheater? Yes. Okay. Yes. I really hope that passes. That's a good, well, we really need this. This is, this will really be good. Well, and I, I know you guys know, but as, as Lynn pointed out, we have a couple of new members, and I have to remember there's a TV audience as well. Um, there are dominoes that go with this as well, because there are those two ball fields at Phillips. We've got Lions Field and Joe Morgan Field that are used by our youth leagues. And so the dominoes, if we start to do this, are going to be where do we move those fields to, where do we move the games to, where do we move the, the practices to. We have those pieces in place. The small field, Lions Field, at, that is at Phillips now and has been used for years, is going to be cut and pasted, if you will, over to Kerr Street, over to Johnny Crawford Field. We have measured it, we've walked it off, we've uh, um, gotten quotes on the fencing, whatever it would take to bring it up to, up to playable standards, and um, uh, that will be, a, a, assuming all these things are a go, that'll be a relatively simple transition. The larger field is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Um, that one is going to go at Jack Amiette. Again, as you guys will recall, that's where we're building the basically the full-size baseball field. Fortunately for us, we think, you know, knock on wood, that all things will, will continue to fall into place, but based on the price quotes we've gotten, based on the designs we've seen by engineers, based on all of the, the people that have to have input, we can get that ball field constructed with lights within 12 months. Yeah. So it's conceivable if we're given the authorization for part of at Phillips, we start that one October 1, which would be the design. By the time we get to the point 
of having to take out Joe Morgan Field, Jack Amiette could be completed. Remember, the little fields are relatively simple. That's, that's not a, a, a real challenge. The bigger challenge is the, is the large field, but the way it's, it's lining up, worst case, we might have to play one season without Jack Amiette, but I think that's absolute worst case. That would, ha that would require some real surprises at one location or the other. So that, that's looking really good. Um, trail crossing at Belfork, one of the concerns uh, that we have had. We are working with at the MPO. Um, we are trying to get some resolution to not just the safety, but also with the surface, because not necessarily at Belfork, but where uh, White Road yes. comes in. Yes. Um, there is that gap that if you're riding a bike, and even if you slow down at the intersection, you're trying to go. Um, it's pretty rough. Yes, it's, it's pretty rough. So we're trying to work through MPO to get, I think it's DOT, all these acronyms. Yeah. Trying to work through uh, the muni municipal planning organization to get on the State Department of Transportation to come in and finish the work they were doing there. Um, easier said than done, but I just wanted you guys to know we're aware of it, we're working on it, we're exerting as much influence a as we can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's not a good transition at all right now. Um, Northeast Creek, a couple things there. We are, and, and we'll hear from the, the Northeast Creek guru later, um, but we uh, um, are continuing to fill in the lagoons, making some, some real progress there. And did we tell them last month about being invited, our invitation? We were invited to put in a grant request to complete where the two boat ramps are, the canoe and kayak launch. And this is one that would only require a 15% city match. So not 50%, not a 15% city match. So it looks like, you know, knock on wood, um, that if we weren't just being teased by the invitation, um, and if and if council uh, will consider it, because again, 15% on a $100,000 project is probably something they would consider, um, then we might be able to get that that end of the Blue Ways trail in much sooner than we had we had anticipated, uh, which would be a, a really good thing. Yeah. Steve, you had asked how many how much dirt had been hauled into the lagoon Do so they know? far. 14,460 cubic yards of dirt. That's a lot of dirt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of dirt, but the actual calculation is 52,000 cubic yards to close yeah. a sale. Yes. So we have, um, we have a, a lot of dirt to go. To go. <laughs> yes. I agree. The, the good news is that uh, Deanna Young and, and Wally Hansen have been working with a lot of the local contractors and there are several um, there are several contractors who have uh, uh, worked out some deals that we're about to close that will allow us to only pay for the a parcel a partial cost of trucking and then grading but the fill dirt and part of the trucking will be paid by someone else mainly someone who needs a detention pond dug so right now we believe that within the next month we will sign a contract for a free 25,000 cubic yards where all we have to pay is $2 a cubic yard for hauling. Uh, Excellent. I go over and check all the time and uh, we kind of slowed down last week because it was yeah. so muddy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, there's <laughs> dump trucks running up and down Corbin Street all the time. And uh, one other qu request, um, uh, actually, I think the chairman had made, uh, I think you had been approached by <coughs> one or more of the local fishermen who used the boat ramp, uh, whether or not we could open it up earlier. And uh, I've checked with everyone I could check with, and no one can come up with any reason why we couldn't open it up earlier. So we're in the process now of figuring out signage and how to, to, how to make it happen. But Excellent. the intent is, basically, it's going to be open. Good. That will make the fisher guys happy yeah. or the fisher people I mean, we, had, we had entertained things like okay let's open it at four that means somebody has to go there and open it at four no let's not do the, do it that way so we're thinking this just 24 7. 
That'd be even better, I guess. You know, we, you know, the intent, and this is why we're having signage, is trickier than you might think. Um, if we, the boat ramp's going to be open 24-7, but the park isn't, sort of thing. So we have to figure out how to not just say all this, but do it in such a way that it's going to be enforceable. Um, so That's why there's lawyers. Yes. Right so we're working on that, those sorts of, of details now, but uh, you can tell your, your Fisher friends that uh, it's coming. It's coming. Excellent. All right. Good. Well, we've already done new business. Yeah, we already did the new business, unless anybody else has any. So do we have any old business? Um, I wanted to bring up, we had sent out an email to all of the members um, previously about, you know, one of your work items for the year was to create spots on G10, highlighting the parks, highlighting trail safety and programs in the park, um, programs in the department. And so I wanted to ask, um, I've had one response of someone volunteering to actually personally participate in these tapings. Um, I wanted to see if That's anyone why she else. Went to the tanning <laughs> yes, I wanted to see if anyone else was interested in participating, and then we'll get together after tonight's meeting and, and decide a good schedule or what topics you would like to, to help with. Amanda's being very polite, and, and that's why I need to bring her along because <laughs> she'll keep me straight. Uh, we need, we're ready to go. Yes. So we need some of you guys to agree to be actors, actresses. Um, family members are fine, relatives are fine, neighbors are fine. Fishermen are fine, um, but we need, we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. So if you guys would, after the meeting, let Amanda know, and she will coordinate with your availability and G10, the, the, those folks' availability mm -hmm. for the location, the time, and, and program or, or service. Um, but it's, we, we need to okay, get the next step. Do you, do you have a GoPro camera by any chance? Or does the... G10 guys I have do one? I don't know. I'll, we'll find out. That, that could come in handy. Okay. Find out. Because they're kind of like small and durable and waterproof. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they don't want to take their big thing and stick it on a kayak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, believe me, they, they okay. stuck it on, they stuck a camera like you're talking about on top of the crane. Yes. that was working on the Center for Public Safety. I've seen those. Mm -hmm. And yeah. got some phenomenal shots. So, Lee, I think they have any kind of camera you want to put on a kayak or somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that was all the uh, old business that we had there, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Spring, you're up. Um, a couple of things. First, from the planning board, we met... Uh, and talked about uh, the VA Veterans uh, Center, which is on Henderson Extension. Basically, it's next to Gold's Gym. Is that wooded area? They're going to have a, oh, a, a, a VA <laughs> um, uh, service center there. Not a service center. Um, Help me. Clinic, thank you. <laughs> and there was some discussion. I'm, a, I'm ashamed to say I'm the one that started it. But there was some discussion about whether we should have continuous joined parking lots and then somebody brought it to my attention that that may not be such a good idea because then the Gold's Gym people may be using all the VA clinic parking spaces. And so uh, uh, thankfully they corrected me and made me see the error of my ways. Uh, second thing uh, has to do with Oslo County Parks and Rec, and it may or may not ever affect us, but there was some talk at our last meeting about the sanctioning of leagues and what kind of leagues they were in. I think our city is in SWAC, is that correct? And some of the other uh, areas in the county were contemplating, you know, deciding to move to other sanctioning leagues. Think, you know, I guess they're testing the waters or trying to we see what's there. We actually do that every year if there is one that's more going to be more beneficial to the kids. Um, but sorry, it yeah. doesn't seem like it has to be an all or nothing thing. No, I mean, no, it doesn't. I think if I'm correct, that Swansboro's in a different. Yeah. Group. I think they are. Yeah, and then and I, I know for years. Jacksonville was in Little Tar Heel League, mm -hmm. as was the White Oak Little League, yes. and then SWAC came in, and I think the county uh, areas went to SWAC, and then mm -hmm. eventually the city went to SWAC too. So, another acronym. Thank you, Statewide <laughs> Activities Commission. Sorry, and that's it for me. Okay. 
Uh, looks like we don't have a council liaison report tonight. Well, Mr. Chair, I did it again. I forgot one thing I was supposed to tell you guys about. <laughs> it's just a, a, a monthly thing. I always forget one. Uh, wanted to give you guys an update on the after school program since tomorrow's the first day back at school. You know all about the year round school that's going on, and, and that's, that program is still working famously. I wanted you to know that the after school programs are literally bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. Carolina Forest has more kids on the wait list than we're able to register. So I want you to think about that. Um, Parkwood has a wait list that's, that's roughly equal to the number of kids that are enrolled in the program. We cannot meet the demand. But I think the, for, for you guys' sake, and, and as you're, you, however much you think about your service here when you're outside of these meetings, this is a program and a service that is well needed, that is valued, uh, that you can be proud of. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame that we're not able to get into Bell Fork Elementary this year. Uh, but we're even pursuing an option, an alternative for that. Um, I think I had mentioned to you guys that Sandy, Sandy Run had approached us about a summer program. Well, we're going back to them saying, would you be interested in an after school program at their little community center? Um, which won't alleviate all of the demand or all the need at Bell Fork Elementary, but it would help alleviate some of it. So um, we are we're con continuing to look at how we can uh, meet this, this need or better meet this need. Um, you might have heard me before the meeting talking about transportation for the middle school program. Um, the middle school program, we have numbers that sort of blow my mind, to be honest with you. That's usually a difficult age group. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've got waiting list. We just we can't meet the demand. Uh, so it's sort of a good problem to have on the one hand. But on the other hand, there are a lot of kids and families that aren't able to get the service that they, they need. Um, but I want you guys to know that it's, it's very successful. It's working well. What's the hold back? Staffing In most cases, most okay. cases it's, it's structural. Okay. It's the building or the room that we have in the building. Um, although we are, we do, I can't deny, we do have some staffing issues also. Um, you can't just hire anybody okay. to work with kids. You know, the criminal background checks and all of those sorts of things to make sure, and then the training. I mean, I, just because someone comes up clean with a background check, that's not enough. I mean, it's really not. So, yeah, we're having some challenges with the younger staff. The senior staff were good, but the younger staff were, were still in the process. So, if anybody out there knows anyone uh, who's interested in working in an after school program with elementary school age kids or even middle school age kids, uh, please call the Department of Recreation and Parks. Do you think Bell Forks just, do you think that may happen next year, or is it done? I think that it's, no, I think it has a good chance of happening next year. I really, I, I think, again, they so benefit from an on-site facility. I'm not trying to, I mean, Sandy Run would be a good option, but I think for a lot of those mm -hmm. people that would be a great program as well. Those Thank you, and I, and I completely agree with you. They, you know, having raised two kids, um, yeah, having them go to from class to an after-school program that's it's in the same building, that's, that's security for, you know, for say, the parents. Yeah, w without being critical or laying, or laying fault, uh, the failure to have a program at that school, though, was not the failure of the city. The council gave all the authorizations that were needed, yes. the staff mm -hmm. prepared everything that was needed. Uh, unfortunately, the school system was not able to accommodate physically the physical plant, and we understand that, but we can say to you again, uh, the mayor and council have already spoken. Uh, now that these programs are self-funded, they will approve as many of these as possible because they're no longer subsidized by the taxpayer. If there is a need and we can find the facility as long as it is not subsidized by the taxpayer, the mayor and council have given us the green light. Thank if you, you don't Jim. mind, uh, let me take the, the slot where the council liaison, uh, Mr. Willingham, is not able to be here this evening. So I'd like to bring you up to date on several things around the city. These won't necessarily be uh, <laughs> parks and recreation things. But uh, as uh, Tim and Amanda and others have kept you apprised, we're very pleased that uh, Representative Cleveland, Representative Shepard, and Senator Brown came to our aid and that the money relative to the Jacksonville Landing did get in the approved budget. 
Uh, we have the design being finalized. I'm sorry, the, the design is finalized. The permits are currently being obtained. And the folks with the Wildlife Commission have told me they anticipate going out for bids in November or December of this year, that they still anticipate that facility being opened by June or July of 2014. So by this time next year, you will have a new downtown boating facility, which we believe will bring a new emphasis to the hidden jewel of Jacksonville, and that's our waterfront. Also in the same general area, uh, you have noticed that the bridge is finally open. I would remind you that your tax dollars, 350,000 of them, is what made the bridge have the adornments and the beauty that it has. The lights that are on <coughs> there are paid for by the city of Jacksonville taxpayer. The Texas Chapel railing, which basically are the adornments, instead of having just a solid concrete rail, what you paid for was those adornments. What we've also been pleased to learn in the last uh, uh, about 30 days is that the DOT is giving us landscaping grants for 17 on both sides of the bridge. So when you currently come in from the uh, area down by the DOT building and you come through the landscaping that's very beautiful, you suddenly get to the intersection where you can go to the right over the Popkin Bridge or to the left over the uh, Phillips Bridge. That long median there is just worn out. Mm -hmm. And we have a grant that will dig all of it out and put in low, low, landscape, low maintenance landscaping, including water. Then on the other end of the bridge, when you get to the intersection of Johnson and 17, uh, close to the Methodist Church, you will uh, notice that there are two medians there, one of which Tim's folks did some good work on a temporary basis of digging out and putting in some brick chips. But that median and the asphalt median <coughs> on the other side of that intersection will all be dug out and will be properly landscaped with the DOT grant. Now those grants are 100% grants. So the city, through that corridor within the next year, and those bids will be awarded in October work to be completed by March so that by the end of, uh, of the summer of next year you will have a boating facility that's finished, a bridge that is open, proper landscaping coming into town and we're also obviously the landscaping we just mentioned there at Johnson. A significant improvement to the downtown area. While we're talking about that same time period the Center for Public Safety is on schedule, it is also on budget knock on wood, uh, the change orders are, are to a, a minimum right now, and we anticipate that being open about this time next year. So when you get all of that going on downtown, all that positive stuff, well, then in addition, if you have been by Riverwalk Park, you will notice that within the last 60 days, the mayor and council concluded the purchase of a number of vacant uh, commercial buildings. Those are all gone that will be grass for a long time. At some time in the future, we may build a parking lot on it as downtown parking is needed. And in the shadow of the park, <coughs> we're pleased to tell you that our public-private partnership for housing, we continue to tear down houses. We tore down two houses uh, a week ago. We have three more houses in that block that we will tear down within the next 30 days. And hopefully by the uh, 1st of October, in that neighborhood, we will have torn down a total of over 20 houses or vacant commercial buildings that have changed the face of the downtown area. So that's kind of a general update. And the one thing I left out is that in November, the city will be awarding the bid for Sturgeon City's first new building. That is a uh, 10 or 11,000 square foot conference area where you will have uh, educational activities and you'll also have the ability to rent it for events. And so Sturgeon City is taking on a new life also. So a lot of good things are happening around the entire community. With that, let me open it up and, and let you have an opportunity to ask about anything mm -hmm. going on in the city that, that you'd like questions or answers on. Okay, the answer to that question is that, <laughs> yes, Lowe's food is coming to town. Yes. 
Uh, Lowe's Food will be the new grocery chain that will come here. It will be located up in front of Williamsburg Plantation. It's generally at the intersection of Gum Branch and Western. So who has the next question? <laughs> I'm just glad you're here. I, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. I, I do. I have one. Uh, suppose we find that a park is just underutilized and just not appropriate or not something we're going to end up uh, at doing more with. Is there a process that we can get rid of that park and sell the land, do something with it to, you know, to benefit us? I mean, I hate to have a huge parcel of land that just goes unused and it's the kind of thing where you may not want to sink any more money into it because it's just not feasible at this time. Yeah. And, and that's a good point. Your recreation master plan spoke to that. And one of the things it said, especially in the neighborhood parks, is folks, you know, neighborhood parks, you'll go broke having neighborhood parks. We've already closed one neighborhood park on market. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, some folks in the county, uh, the county manager asked if we had any excess park equipment. We were able to donate it to a low-income neighborhood. They installed it. That was great. The answer to, to your question is yes where we have land that is underutilized and we do not see a need for it for the future, it is in our best interest to, to disengage that park. We would take that through city council with a recommendation from you, and then we would determine how we would dispose of that property. If I could just follow up on, on Richard's response a, a little bit. The master plan absolutely, what he just said. But the other piece of that is, in their opinion, the city was short on the amount of park land. So while they recognize the lack of viability of some of the neighborhood parks, the really the small ones, um, they are recommending growing some of the exist, like the, the community parks like Jack and the Ed, um, regional parks like Northeast Creek. Um, and, and there's, there's really a science to that, as you guys who looked at the master plan probably recall. Basically, oversimplifying, a community park will serve three to five miles in circumference around it. A regional park, people will drive to. They'll drive to the commons. They'll drive to Northeast Creek. Those, those sorts of things. So their recommendation is maybe the neighborhood parks are no longer feasible but the community parks and the regional parks still serve a purpose and that's where we should when the time is right when the financial situation is better that's where we should be expanding well, well i'm sure when we did well i know when we did the master plan we had no idea of the uh, huge parcel of land that was going to go that was going to get donated to us uh for the you know that we were talking about some kind of passive you know trail walking trail the area that's uh between Carolina Forest and the Commons back there, and of course that does add to your land. Yes, about hopefully. 200 acres. Yeah, but but and I know there are restrictions because a lot of it's wetlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's one of the things that we have not done yet, to my knowledge, as a city. We know a lot of it is undevelopable. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. um, but we really don't know how much of it is developable. <laughs> mm -hmm. So some of that detail we have to look into. Mm -hmm. Richard, if you're looking for questions, there's an area behind Longley <coughs> Supply that was uh, lumbered, oh, two or three years ago. Yeah, I take it that belongs to the city. Are there any plans to put anything over there? There's probably yes. 10 to 20 acres in there, be my guess. Actually, it's, uh, it, there's, it's a rather large piece of property, and it's property that came to the city as part of the Rails to Trails program. Our plan there is to build a railhead for the Rails to Trails. Mm -hmm to build a multi-purpose transit center and to build fire station five. So all of that property will be turned into a real center. Uh, now, funding for that is certainly not this coming year, but the plan is being put in place and hopefully over the next three, four, five, ten years maximum, you would see that type of facility there. And again, by putting in a multi-purpose facility, you could have someone ride their bicycle to that location, catch a bus wherever they need to go to work, and then get back home the same way. Also, by having the fire station there, it gives us a full-time presence that allows us to have good security and, and good utilization. But it's a nice piece of property. Uh, John Carter, the city attorney, has worked out the 
details with the uh, federal government on the use of it. Anthony Prince with the Metropolitan Planning Organization has been working on that and we will be bringing that report back to the council probably late fall. Anything else I can answer for you? <coughs> yes, not. Okay, thank you for letting me join you tonight. Our pleasure, actually. Thank you. We'll see you next month. <laughs> All right, get us to park reports. Bill. Okay. Uh, what can I say? It hadn't already been said. <laughs> Just for people to, to go by and see it and how much it's, how much it's uh, improved, the, the uh, playground with the rubber mats or, and uh, the basketball courts and, of course, the restrooms. So it really is going to look really good. Jacksonville can be proud of it. And uh, it's just excellent. Lori? Um, Richard Ray would look really good when I was out there uh, this past Saturday. I did get stopped by a young lady. I see her all the time with her children. She was asking about vendors that could come out, if they're allowed to come out and during the nice days, and like the ice cream trucks, that type of thing. So I was like, I have no idea. Have her call Amanda. Okay. okay. It's one lady I run into all the time out there. And then um, the corner lot, we talked to as many moons ago. I don't know how to describe it. It's uh, kind of like by where the fire station is. We talked mm -hmm. one time about maybe that doing bike trail type. Is that still? That um, most of the trails have been cut. So that's okay. It's, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff's uh, folks have been working on it. Park staff has been working on it. Folks from the land app land application site okay. have been working on it. We've got most of the network trails in there rough cut, if you will. Uh, we're waiting for some fine tuning. Uh, we're looking at a Boy Scout troop doing some of the entrance signage and those sorts of things. Uh, but yes, that's uh, well on its way. Okay. Yeah, let me mention that a second. Um, that's an idea that came to us from just simply saying, you know, it's an unused piece of property. The city owns it. Let's find a use for it. And so what we're put building in there is something we're going to call the Commons Challenge Course. It already has uh, almost uh, probably uh, at least a half a mile, if not more, of trail cut through the woods. Generally eight feet wide. It is up and down. It is dirty. You're not going to go in there with a pair of white tennis shoes and come out with white tennis shoes. <laughs> but if you are tired of running on the asphalt or the sidewalk and you'd like something different, we've laid the course out. And we're going to be doing a spot on G10 on this, introducing it, but this is a good time to do it. We've laid the course out so that it is very safe from the standpoint of while you're in the woods, you're never that far away from being out of the woods. You're also going to have at least four, if not more, exit or entrance points. They will be marked. Uh, we're working with the Boy Scout. Unfortunately, his leadership group was not present this past week, otherwise his Boy Scout project would have been approved so that he could start building some of the actual entrance ways so that you could uh, have something and like I said it'll be called the Commons Challenge Course. You'll have Gate 1, Gate 2 and so forth. You'll have maps so you'll know where you're going. You'll be able to ride a bike in there, you'll be able to run, you'll be able to walk. Now, nothing motorized can, can go in there. In addition to that, Jeff's folks will be cutting some intermediate trails that are not intended to be wide but very very narrow but that's a recreation opportunity that has cost us almost nothing and yet it's going to be I think a phenomenal new opportunity we've had young Marines who have donated uh, 20 and 40 hours worth of cutting time in there and hauling out and we ex we anticipate bringing that trail all the way down by the water tank and by the uh, recreation maintenance because all there are is woods, so why not cut more trails and give people even more area that they can just run and, and have a good time? And like I said, if you can do it for almost nothing, yeah. that's pretty good. Pretty good return on your investment. That answer? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Homer. Okay. Uh, number one, my, my first question, uh, let, let's start with Brook Valley and Sherwood. I went to both those. Uh, both were being utilized uh, by people today, which is pretty good. They were well, well kept, well manicured. I, I had no problem with that. But I had a person who asked me about restrooms, and it made me think: What criteria do we use when we decide this park needs a restroom, this park doesn't need a restroom? 
knowing that the parks are a little different. For example, Brook Valley and Sherwood both have picnic shelters. The thinking is that somebody might rent it or reserve it and have a picnic. Well, the person I talked to said, well, we sort of, we wouldn't do that because if anybody needs to use the bathroom, they've either got to run to somebody's backyard or they're just out of luck. So um, that made me think the question, okay, when do you decide this is a good place for a restroom? Just throwing that out. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Phillips Park. It was being uh, well used. There was a gentleman fishing with his son down there in the water. I don't know what they were catching. I, I tend, I try not to go too close to people when they're there because they tend to look <coughs> squeamish when I show up. Um, there were a couple people on the playground when I showed up. They, they sort of, you know, grabbed their kid and went somewhere else. <laughs> but, uh, on the park itself, on uh, both on the little league field. There's some spots where the fence has come away from the top and probably needs to be pinned down. You can tell someone's been dragging the field because the uh, tractor wheels are, you know, showing signs in the infield, which, which it shows you're dragging it, but, you know, it's still too muddy to get anything yes. out of it. I do have a question about Phillips. Is, is That's currently being used by one of our middle schools? Yes, Newbridge. Are they using it now? Because I don't know when girls. I don't think they're starts. using it yet, but yes, they use that as for their teams. Okay, so I know boys baseball for Newbridge would be in the spring, yes. but girls softball would be sometime coming up. Yeah, we'll have to. I think they, yeah. they just have an announcement. That's part of their tryouts. football. I know football, and I think girls softball, softball was the other. They had tryouts last tryouts. week. The reason I say that is if. And, and again, this is this is something you and I had talked about. It's not the best looking park we have. Um, Newbridge comes in and you know they use it and they're getting good use out of it. We're bringing in people from other schools around the county. They come in and they think that's representative of Jacksonville. And uh, you know, I, I just don't know what to do because you know it, we ought to have a better place. But again, we it's in a state of flux right now because we don't know how long you know a year or so before we tear the place down. And, move everything to somewhere else. Uh, at this point in time, about all I could recommend is slapping a good coat of paint on the restroom floors and uh, and maybe doing some work in the baseball dugout. The, right. You know, the benches in there probably could use some paints, uh, maybe some different boards and something maybe anchored down because right now you can sort of kick them open. But, and, and like you said, we have talked about this before and that's the crux of the problem. When you know a facility is going to be removed. How much do you invest in the meantime? But your, your points are well made. Uh, at least a, a coat of paint or something to spruce it up in the meantime. Well, yeah, and that's as much as we can do. Um, you know, it, it's not like we're putting somebody there. I'm sure that if Newbridge were to say, we want some other place to play our games, you know, the city would accommodate them. But again, it's very close to the school. It's, it's very, very convenient. convenient. It's very convenient. Yeah. And so, uh, I hope everyone understands when they come to visit that park that it's you know it, it's on its way out and mm -hmm. we're you know, Mr. Spring, though one thing we should do is and assuming that the city council authorizes the request to move forward on Tuesday evening then I think you make a good point we need to put signage up large signage up that lets people know that this park is in is in transition mm -hmm. and this is what the new park is going to look like so because you're right Somebody comes to, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's just a, a citizen who lives next to you here in town. They go to a facility like that and they say, wow, this is the best we can do. This, rep this represents our community. Well, if they don't know about the big plan, then they don't know about the big plan. So we can work on better signage <coughs> to inform them of the, of the future. And I mean, <coughs> I mean, I played on worse fields. I mean, trust me, I played on worse fields. And, it wasn't a bad field. It's just an old field, right. and there's some things that just—it's it, been well used. It, it would not make sense. It would not make sense to put a pitcher's mound and, and drop a lot of dirt in the middle of that field mm -hmm. if you're going to use it in girls softball now, because right. you'll just end up having to tear the thing up. Mm -hmm. um, so, good point. And then the uh, last thing I was going to mention is that Branchwood is severely underused. Um, it, the <coughs> parking there is non-existent. When when I pulled in today, there were two or three other people parked in there front of their houses which made it almost impossible for me to get in and get out um, it's a huge it looks like a fairly good sized piece of land that may bring you know some money somewhere and uh, and at the time it was put there 
we didn't have the commons, but mm -hmm. now people that live in Branchwood and, and the areas where I live can jump in a car and get to Bran get to uh, the commons. Well, and for the television audience, let me say it's 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 relative. For if you're a, it's a large piece of land, if you're looking to build homes mm -hmm. or something. Oh yeah. For a park, it's not no. a large piece of land, so it. it Put that in little well, it's landscaped well. For I mean, I could see a house sitting back there would look really nice, but but you're right. It, there's not a whole lot you can do in there. I mean, you're not going to be able to go in and put a parking lot inside there just because the topography is going to make it very difficult. <coughs> That's it for me. All right, Lynn. Um, Northwood's new new report and Woodlands looks good as well as Car Street. And maybe you have them there for, but the signage looked really good at Woodlands. I don't know if it, you, you could really see the park hours. That was, I don't think it's been there for a while. Maybe it has, but just <laughs> 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 so hours. We got a new hours. Oh, maybe at Woodlands? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I haven't seen it first. Okay. Yeah. I know you want to. Yeah, I know I do. I do know that. <laughs> it looks good. Okay. Uh, I was at Northeast Creek on Saturday. Uh, as you drive in, there's a giant like DOT display saying the speed limit's 15. So I guess somebody's speeding down the road towards a boat ramp. <laughs> I guess it's dump trucks. Oh, no, actually, it's the fishermen who are so excited. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, there's huge speed bumps when you get down there. I mean, yes, they're they're monsters. They removed a number of the speed bumps yeah. to make it easier for the dump trucks to gain access to the lagoon area. Oh, so I, I never drive down. I always prompted walk, so. it. Yes. Yeah, big thing. It's like, <laughs> hmm, look at that. Uh, a lot of people playing disc golf. Uh, mm -hmm. There were, I counted eight pickup trucks with boat trailers parked down there. Mm -hmm. Two more drove in while I was down there. A whole bunch of other people parked by the uh, down by the boat ramp. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people walking their dogs. Uh, it was a busy place. There's some family having a big cookout up in picnic shelter number one. Mm -hmm. Lots of uh, kids over in a playground. The place looked phenomenal. So it was, since it's been raining for the past month, I guess it was the first chance anybody had to get outside. So it, it looked good and it was being well utilized. Okay. All right, that's all I got on that. Uh, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about neighborhood parks and uh, the Northeast Creeks and the Commons. Uh, Wilson Bay is one of the neighborhood parks that, uh, when I went in there, uh, there were three parking places available. Mm -hmm. Everything else was filled, and I counted about 15 or 20 people, and there were three, three, three people out at the gazebo fishing. Uh, I mean, it, it's well, and it's been very consistent that way. Uh, most every time I go down there. Uh, Sturgeon, and they, and they look fine. I didn't see anything. Uh, well, I think they've already got the, uh, one of the stalls in the bathroom. They've already got roped off, but it's, I think it's in the process <coughs> of being repaired. Uh, Sturgeon City looks fine. Uh, wasn't as utilized as Wilson Bay, but there were people there. Uh, I do have a question. I don't know if I've been blind for a long time or what, but uh, there are three of these, look like duck blinds or uh, replicas, miniature replicas of the Monitor or Merrimack from the Civil War out sitting out in the Wilson Bay out there. And there is. <laughs> and there's something going on. They got a mo motor, but they're not going anywhere, okay? What? They're aerators. Aerators. Okay. Well, they, they were all functioning. So, uh, Actually, they've been there since the Civil War. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> that's what I said. I mean, but I had the Civil War signs, you know, so that's something I've just been missing. So anyhow. Well, Lauren, to your, your point about Sturgeon City Park not being as heavily utilized, um, we recognize that. And until finances are such that we're de continuing to develop that site, we're starting to hold some events down there, like this weekend, we're having a kite flying event, okay. uh, where we have a, uh, this guy from Raleigh coming yeah. out with all his fancy kites, and so we're going to start, you'll start seeing more of that sort of activity, okay. trying to draw people down to Sturgeon yeah. City. Because, I mean, you, you know, you have very adequate parking down there, I mean, and it's very nice, wide open, it's really nice down there, it really is. Uh, and I think probably either number one, a lot of people haven't been there to see it. Mm -hmm. 
and number two, you probably it's one of those that you kind of have to be going there, so to speak. Yeah. It's a uh, uh, it's a bit separate by itself. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, the trail, uh, again, we've already discussed some of the crossings, and other than that, uh, do you see anything, Nick, on the trail? That no, it hasn't changed. It's still yeah, it looks pretty good. So okay, okay. gets us up to Jeff. He, he What's hasn't your seen. Surprise? It. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that I had a. I didn't know that I had a part today, but um, I do ride my bike by that both areas, Georgetown and Jack Hammett, quite often. Um, so you know, I'll definitely start to um, pick up on maybe some small things that I haven't. But um, last time I was at Jack Jack Hammett, we were doing a uh, free bicycle repair for kids, and there was tons of kids on bikes riding around, and the basketball courts were getting used and. So I wasn't really paying much attention to if you know facilities were being kept up and stuff like that. But anything sure you see, let us know. And now you know your homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good places yeah. too because they're right by me. So. Yeah. so Jeff, didn't you also have this past uh, Friday another bicycle? Why don't you report on that yeah. real quick? Um, on Friday, um, we um, we went out and. Um, um, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, we set up a free bicycle pair at the Northwoods Recreation Center mm -hmm. for, for kids. Um, we try to focus on low-income areas because those are the kids that really can use that. Yeah. So, you know, we did the Jack Amiette on that area first. And then our second outreach was um, and, uh, um, in that Northwoods area. And we really went off to the, I forget the name of the neighborhood, but off to the right side of the road yeah. where there's a lot of really low-income houses. Yeah. Um, and we had 30, 32 kids come out in the two hours, and we fixed their bikes and put tons of new tubes in, and everything was free. Well, then you're part of the, the that nonprofit. It's a nonprofit group, isn't it? That's, mm -hmm. that's coordinating that. So I um, I met up with a um, a gentleman named Brandon Laney, and he um, he started the nonprofit in Virginia actually, then quickly moved to Wilmington. Um, we met up because he was doing this bicycle repair in Wilmington. And I said, you know, can yeah. we set something up in um, Jacksonville? So. Um, we have our next one, um, um, two Fridays from last Friday, um, mm -hmm. set up at Northeast Creek Park. Um, and we're um, going to really target that Holiday City area there, um, and then some of the other houses around that area as well. Do you have a time? Uh, it's 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got, after that one, there's, um, there's two more um, coming up in about three week increments after that in lo low income areas around town. Information on those are on the city website. Mm -hmm. So on the Recreation and Parks page, you can find that information there. But again, we, we certainly commend uh, Jeff for using his <coughs> business, which obviously is the bicycle business, uh, to bring these types of uh, recreation activities. Right. Because obviously it's pretty hard to ride a bicycle with flat tires or a broken <laughs> chain. So again, uh, Jeff, on behalf of the City Council, I'll extend to you their appreciation for what you're doing. All right, Nick, got anything to add? The only thing I have, we, what I mentioned in the last meeting about that section of trail that's in need of repair. Mm -hmm. I go by there six days a week, and the thing that drives me crazy, I'm trying to think what adverse effect did that trail have in the building of the road, why they had to tear it up. I can't figure it out yet. When I do, I'll share it with everybody. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> let, me mention, uh, let me mention two other things that I, I think you may be aware of, but I want to make sure. Talking about rails to trails, uh, the city has now secured all of the funding to finish the last phase of the rails to trails. We're in the process of securing the final easement from the military, and what that will then do is the city will install a sidewalk generally from City Hall up to the military cemetery and then the rails to trails program will go from there all the way up to the generally uh, to where the trail stops in the Belfork Road area. The new bypass or bridge or gate entrance whatever mm -hmm. the proper title is into uh, the uh, Camp Lejeune area once again it contains the underpass so hopefully within the next three months, we'll be awarding a bid to get under construction for that final phase of the Rails to Trails program. Then the last thing that I'm sure Tim has mentioned to you before, and you mentioned, uh, Jack, uh, you mentioned Richard Ray Park. The Eford family has donated 
the necessary funds along with uh, uh, Debbie Ray Rouse for the installation of a labyrinth. And that is now in. Within the next two weeks, we'll be <coughs> landscaping. We're going to bring, be bringing in some large boulders to be part of the amenity there. And if you've ever walked a labyrinth, if you don't know what it is, it is basically a meditation walk that you can take. It's, this one is installed first class with a brick that has different patterns in it, so you walk the pattern. And I think you're going to find that when we have the dedication, obviously you'll be invited, but I think the public is going to heavily utilize this when it's officially opened in about 30 days. Where are you importing boulders from? There's no rocks around here. Boulder, Colorado. Where? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, we, what we found here are some very large pieces of cap rock almost the size of these individual tables, uh, eight or 10 feet in length, six or seven feet in width, and two or three feet in height. And we're bringing them in uh, to have them become features in the park where kids can simply climb up and down rocks. So that's, that's a unique feature for Eastern North Carolina. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, thank you for letting me join you tonight. Right. If there's nothing else, next meeting is uh, September 23rd. Right here, 6 o'clock. I'm looking for a motion. Motion adjourned. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries.